So we'll, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, this is the, the talk. For anyone that's been to uh, BroCon for, for, I don't know, quite a few years, we, we've been doing this talk for five, a while. five, five a six while. years, something like that. Um, <laughs> it, it's, it's really kind of our chance to say like where we've been thinking about you know, what, what Bro should do and where to take it and where we see problems and where we'd like to fix things. But uh, go ahead and move the, uh, the slide forward. We do want to point out that this is really, you know, we're essentially saying our development priorities, but if you pay attention to releases, um, the releases always have way more stuff than we ever talk about in these. And it usually comes down to individual <clears throat> individual motivation. Um, uh, we always have individuals that come along and say, I want to work on this, and here is this new thingy, and then it gets merged in. Um, so we did want to be clear that this is not like we're telling anyone that's going to work on Bro, these are the things you have to work on. This is what we're going to be working on, probably, in addition to other stuff that we didn't want to put on here. <laughs> yeah. I mean, people, I've heard the question a few times over the course of BroCon, so how does something get on the Bro roadmap, or the Zeek roadmap, I guess? In some sense, I think this thing doesn't exist. I mean, it's really what people want to work on, and this is what's on our heads at this point. So I guess the first item is probably very clear after yesterday. I mean, there's, there's quite a bit of work to do on the renaming. Um, and the specific, specifics for that really haven't been figured out at this point. I mean, it's, it's, it's um, a major move for the project, obviously, and, and the name Bro has proliferated at so many places over the years um, that you really need to think about how to approach that. And that is something, I think, for the, for the leadership team, for the developers to, to really um, um, be careful about as well, right? We don't want to break existing scripts, so that's maybe the, the most important thing to point out. Um, that we, there will be a, pro, a process which will take place over a few weeks, months probably. Um, and yeah, we will be careful to uh, not just put Zeek in it in place and not have any fallback, I guess, for Bro in it. Things like that. Yeah, Bro in it will still be there. <laughs> At first. <laughs> yeah, at first, that's right. I mean, the, the natural thing to do would be like deprecate certain things, right? And then it's, it's still available. And then over time, at some point, they get removed once people had a chance to, to migrate. But it's really a question how deep to go with this renaming. I mean, if you look at the code base, bros everywhere. Well, I mean, it, it even extends <clears throat> all the way to, <laughs> sorry. <clears throat> it, all, it extends all the way to sub-project names, yep. like, like Broker, and we'll probably leave the name Broker alone, I imagine, because like, it is sort of its own term, but you know, that, that Bro name has gotten so pervasive that it's just literally everywhere. And there's some places it'll get left, like Broker, but many, many places it'll probably go away. Yeah, yeah. And you don't need to uh, think about broccoli either, though there was this very nice suggestion on Twitter <laughs> that would be zucchini, I guess. <laughs> Anyways. Well, so, yeah, and specifically the point Robin's making is that broccoli is going away, so right. that won't be getting renamed because it won't be a thing anymore. And I'm sure that Christian will be ecstatic about that. <laughs> uh, Christian Krybic wrote it years ago. Yeah. OK, so that is, I guess, one obvious piece. There's a bit of more. Um, <clears throat> infrastructure work which we have already started actually and that is we want to um, fully move the project over to github so the tickets are already there um, the git repositories will move over as well and we basically will retire the current um, dedicated server so github will become the authoritative source for the source code and um, the documentation we are planning to move to read the docs um, because that's uh, it's working very well for the broker documentation so i think it makes sense to move the rest there too and it means now that every time Ixi, or sorry, every time Berkeley has a power outage, which happens all the time, <laughs> the Bro website and repository will still be there. Yeah. <laughs> but CloudFront is already protecting us for the website, yeah, but, but yeah. Git is now going down like every time. It's uh, not so great. OK, so let's move on to some larger things we have in mind um, that we really uh, believe are realistic in the 2.7 timeframe. So uh, I'll explain what this means. <laughs> um, the way that everyone runs Bro right now uh, sort of evolved in an ad hoc manner. In 2006, there was a project at ICSI that Robin and Matthias and 
I don't even know who participated in that. Some other people, too. Um, yeah. There was the, the cluster project. Yep. So the idea in 2006, I believe, was uh, to say, look, we can't, one single bro process can't do everything anymore, so let's spread you know, the analysis across a lot of systems. And they went out and got vendors to start making equipment that would do this for them to load balance. And now there's a whole industry there for network packet brokers. But um, the, the problem then became, OK, well, now I've got a lot of processes to run. And so Robin started working on a Python program just to help him you know, manage bro processes on a bunch of systems. And it was called the cluster shell. And um, over time, eventually, everyone realized, well, this is a necessary thing. And it became bro control. There was a lot of discussion years ago, and it became bro control. Bro control is abnormal in the sense that how many other pieces of software do you use that work that way? Probably none. Like where you run it and it sort of runs these processes in the background and it's just sort of abnormal. The other problem is that, uh, and a lot of people have a tendency to not even configure things because they don't know about it or whatever the reason is. Um, they, there, there's a bro control cron command and it just, you like run it in cron and then you run bro control cron every five minutes or something, and if any processes are dead, it restarts them, which means you may have a lag of five minutes from when a process dies until you restart it. Um, this is just not the way things work anymore. And, and really, it, it kind of evolved ad hoc just from a need. It was like, imagine you know, you're sitting and writing something for your own utility on your own thing, and then all of a sudden, everyone in this room and way more people start using it, and it's like, this was really just sort of this internal thing. And I kind of boxed Robin into a corner because I started using it operationally. That was the problem. <laughs> I, was, I couldn't do it any other way. But, and I definitely didn't want to run it myself. Uh, so anyway, we, we find ourselves with the world we've ended up with today where Bro is kind of weird, the way it runs and the way you use it. Um, but we've entered the, the, the new world is that you have supervisors. System D is a supervisor. It runs processes in the foreground. and. Uh, if something dies, it restarts it right away. And you know, a lot of people run things with supervisors. Some people use like supervisor D or a number of other things. But the whole point is they run things in the foreground. Um, so I started, we, we actually talked about this quite a while ago, and it got dismissed really quickly because it was sort of like, ha ha ha, terrible idea. But then I started prototyping it four months ago or so. And um, I have a prototype now where I can start up a cluster where I run bro and I say, I want 10 workers, and it starts up a cluster. And it runs everything in the foreground. If a bro worker dies, that parent worker, or sorry, the parent supervisor bro process restarts it immediately because it noticed it died. And it writes out a bro log to say that it did it, but it's all a bro log. It's all bro. There's never a point where. So even when you run a cluster, you're still just running bro. You're not running something different. Um, so it fits into this world of system D. And Docker has the same problem, where Docker needs an entry point. Well, hopefully after 2.7, the entry point will be bro. You're like, I need a whole cluster, though. And you're like, entry point is still bro. It'll start up children and deal with everything really nicely. So I, in the next slide, I have, uh, this is the prototype on my laptop right now. It's this PS tree view of it. So you can see there's bro running, the parent at the very top, if you can see that, is bro running supervisor.bro. And what supervisor.bro is, is it's the supervisor script. And so this is the way many things in bro happen. Uh, it frequently happens this way. I write some terrible prototype, and then we understand like, how, what we're trying to accomplish, and then we come back and just redo the whole thing. Johanna's uh, config framework was exactly that process. Um, but you can see, I ran it this way. It started up a manager, a logger, workers. Uh, it's, it's a cluster, but it's extremely easy because it's, it's just, you don't, you're like, what about bro control? And you're like, don't worry about it. Just run it in the foreground. If you just want to like set something up quickly to play with, you just run it. You don't worry about it. It'll start up the whole thing for you. And there's going to be a lot more information coming out about this. Like we've really thought through it quite a bit already. But anyway, I just wanted to sort of bring up initially that this is something I'm thinking about, because Bro doesn't quite fit into the modern world in, in all cases, and we want to make it better with that. Yeah. Maybe one additional point that's interesting how this, like, like, I mean, we originally at some point we set out to find a better model for Bro control itself, um, given all those disadvantages Seth was, was mentioning. 
And we were thinking about turning bro control into a supervisor. There's actually on the development pages on, on Bro.org, there's a proposal for, for the, how that would look like. So we kind of started sketching this out and, and kind of discussing it, putting it out in the open. Um, but then I think the, the, the discussion came of kind of return to why not actually move the supervision right into Bro. And then that is this model. And I think it makes a lot of sense to have it right there and come to a much better solution that way. Yeah. And, and I, I will say that like, this is wildly incomplete. Like, it, it looks way more complete than it really is. This is not functional yeah. yet. But uh, this is actually just a bro script. It's running what is 2.6. Uh, I fixed a bug in the input framework at the last minute in 2.6. But uh, that's just a script. Like, there's no, I didn't change anything in bro at all. And it's, it's already a prototype, which is kind of cool, actually. A lot of things end up that way, where it's terrible, totally script-written things. And eventually, we're still figuring out ways of making this really, really nice so that things are very not painful. OK, let's move on. The next thing, um, I think at this point, probably many have heard about Spicy. There was a demo a few years ago here. It's, it's the next generation parser generator. It was, used to be called Binpack++, which describes it pretty well, I think. And um, as many of you know, there is a prototype. So basically, we have the system up and running and, and, and has, I think, proven at this point that the model for writing parsers in this new system actually works pretty well. So a number of people, both um, in our group but also like, externally, externally, have started writing spicy parsers. And the feedback is extremely good. And, and it really lowers the bar quite a bit. The problem is the implementation remains a prototype at this point. And that is not surprising. It's, it's basically at the state of a, of a research project. So like many things in Bro, um, there's an initial prototype of new functionality, um, often coming out of like, like research funding, just like Spicy. And then it takes us a second generation, essentially, to make this real. And, and this is where we are right now. And at this point, um, putting on the Colette head for this one, Colette has actually committed to taking on Spicy and making it real. So, so um, this is something which I believe will happen during the next year, probably. I don't know, maybe, maybe by mid of the year, there should be something available. It will be fully open source. It will be BSD licensed. It will be going back into Bro. And I think it will be uh, moving uh, Bro quite a bit forward. And just to give you an impression, so if you've never heard much about Spicy so far, this is, I don't know, a very like, tiny example of a Spicy grammar, how you would pass um, an HTTP request. And the most interest, so this is, at this level, it's, it's not too different from Binpack. There are more features. But the most interesting part is at the very bottom. Hope you, you guys can see it. It's, it's compiling like this, this specification into a parser on the fly just in time. So that means um, in a future bro world, Zeek world, <laughs> um, you will be able to give Zeek a script like this, just like you give it a bro script today, and it will like, on the fly give you the parser, turn, it into a, turn the parse stuff into events, and you have it available inside your inside your bro scripts, Zeek scripts. <laughs> and um, I don't know, may, and then at some point, maybe there will be uh, Zeek packages which just come with a new parser written in this language. So that is, that is the vision. And I think it's, it's actually realistic at this point that we can make that happen um, during the next year, I would say. And, and keep in mind that the, it, it could be file parsers written yep. in this too. So some, you could sit down and write a JPEG parser and put it on the bro package. Zeek package manager, <laughs> and um, and then other people can just run it. No rebuilding, bro. You don't need the. It's not. You don't need a compiler. You just need bro, and it will just run it. It's another scripting language. And, and the other nice thing is if you're writing parsers in C by hand, it's very possible you can introduce vulnerabilities into bro. This, hopefully, is a safe language so that you can sort of experiment. And you might make like, something not work, but it's not going to introduce security vulnerabilities, which makes it, it should make it much less scary to take other people's code just off the package manager and run it. Because there's not going to be like, oh, well, that one has a buffer overflow in it, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, hard to, it's hard to ever avoid saying hopefully. Wait, but, but, but I mean, at, at that point, it's, it's about making sure that the spicy platform essentially is safe, yeah. right? So it's not about that individual parser anymore, because the model is that the environment is safe for those to run in. And, and Robin is being modest. This is actually the third implementation. <laughs> True. That was an original Python prototype. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not counting that one. OK. 
Um, I'll talk about that. So the, we, uh, some of you may have heard us talk about this before. Network traffic is great, right? I think everyone in this room will probably agree with that. It's pretty cool having network traffic. But what would be cooler is if you had network traffic and a platform that natively integrated it with data from hosts and endpoints. Um, and it, it's not even about, like, uh, I, I've, I've talked to people. Sometimes I have a hard time, like, getting across the sort of full thought to this. And there's another slide in a second where we'll show an example. But uh, it's not so much like, well, I take these two sets of data and pull them into something and then analyze all the data. This is actively about having the ability to treat endpoints as nearly programmable just the same as your network is, is programmable. Like, so you can program the network with Bro to come up with understanding there, and you can program the endpoints and then treat it as all one big unit of analysis. And uh, it gives you the ability to create composite logs where you, know, you look at Bro logs and you're like, it's got all these fields, and you're like, Right now, the mindset is some of those fields come from the request, or like HTTP. Some of the fields in that log come from the request. Some of those fields in that log come from the reply. Some of those fields in that log come from the endpoint. Why not? Seems reasonable if you think about it that way. It's a hard problem, but I think that this is actually a model where we, we really can reasonably pull this off. It it's, should be interesting. Go ahead and move to the next slide. So if you can see this, you actually define OS query. If you can do queries with SQL to, to, uh, to host information. But you write a bro script, and you're like centrally, and you've just got these OS query endpoints connecting to you, and they don't know anything. All they know is who to connect to. You go to the bro package manager and grab, you know, someone's like, oh, I've got this OS query script, you know, and it does something. You pull that down, and you start running it, and that script sends this select query off to all your endpoints. And it says select p PID path command line current working directory UID GID time parent from process events. So all the endpoints receive that, or if you've grouped it or whatever. But the, a number of endpoints receive that. Then you end up with a bro event. So you now, in, your, in bro, you're like, OK, what are my events I can work with? I've got connection established, connection state remove, uh, Zeek init. Um, I've got a HTTP request, I've got host process events, I've got syslog message, and then you go, wait a minute, what? I have host process events. I can just handle that event just like everything else. And so it, is, it creates this level of abstraction for you as a programmer to say, well, that's interesting. The heavy lift of getting that data to me was taken care of, and I can sort of separate that mentally. And now I can just get to think about this one environment where I can say, I've got that event and that event, and what if I like, put them together? Or what if I, you know, maybe there's some detection where like, I see that, I remember that like, that HTTP request happened for 10 minutes, and then I see you know, this process start up on a system, and that's interesting. I think this is, this is going to be interesting. I, I think that that's kind of the takeaway. Uh, Stefan Esser, Esser, right? Haas. Haas. Well, I think, I think well. Stefan Haas yeah. is, is a student in, in Hamburg who has actually wrote uh, the prototype implement, implementation of this, which you can find at that, that GitHub URL there. So this is, this is another one of those projects which, which it, it works. I mean, it's not production ready yet. We, we kind of need to work on the deployment um, scenario and model for that in particular, but it works. So there's um, it's an OS query extension um, using Broker to communicate back to Bro. Bro is sending over the queries, events are coming back, or the results to the query are coming back, and then Bro is turning them into events. And on the Bro side, this is literally the code that it takes to generate a host-based event from all the OS queries connected to your Bro in your network. And, and there is actually one other interesting point. Because it's done over broker, uh, Robin and Johanna, and maybe other people worked on this a while ago, um, broker connections are encrypted by default. Mm -hmm. And so, so, you know, consider that you have, you know, Windows systems or Linux systems, whatever, connecting back to you. And, like, that's kind of weird because you don't know where they might be. They might, like, in here, there might be someone with an OS query connection, right, you know, out. Um, it, it, it's encrypted by default. I, I don't even know if you can not do it encrypted. Did you guys enable You can it? turn it off if you want. Okay. Well, yeah. you have to actively turn off encryption. And just as a kind of cool note, I thought it's, it's, 
it's encryption, it's not using certificates by default, so you don't actually trust the endpoint. You can add that, but it is at least by default encrypted, so someone just passively watching can't actually see anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, which is almost required for a model like this, where people might be connected to untrusted networks, at the very least, from the perspective of passive monitoring, it really has to be encrypted because of the, the sensitivity of the data, because it's... No one, I, I will say, I, I have, uh, in, in Correlate, I have a, an endpoint up running the, the bro side of this. So far, I've not convinced anyone to run <laughs> OS Query on their endpoint because it gives me the ability <laughs> to understand their computer. Yeah. Every, every time Seth makes a suggestion to somebody, everyone's going, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, here's a binary. You want to run it? You just say, like, run it, and here's the arguments. Like, I'm, I, I need like something. Anyway, whatever. There, there's, there's something we may end up doing for auditability so a user can actually feel comfortable that they aren't being spied on by the defenders. But yeah. I, there's still a lot of exploration yeah. to do there. So we're seeing a lot of interest in this. We're actually also from the OS query community. So we're, we're in touch with them, and they, they, they like this quite a bit. Our goal is, and, and, and um, I think it's, it's very realistic, to get this into upstream OS query so that, that pretty much every OS query installation will have bro integration out of the box, which makes deployment at that point really easy. And, 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 and this is a really um, generally available capability, I would say. Yeah, so I guess the point is if people end up doing OS query deployments, at some point it may just support bro if you run it the right way, which is kind of exciting. So well, that's, that's, of course, part of the work we have to still to do. We have to kind of get it really um, um, into shape, essentially, for this upstream merge and, and have to iron out a few uh, um, kinks there. And, and, um, but I think it's, it's looking good. Um, broker. So, so I mean, um, has been mentioned a few times during this, this conference already, so two six ships with broker by default on now, basically, all, all the existing scripts that do communication have been ported over to broker. And um, as Vern said, ideally, you shouldn't be seeing much of a difference. I mean, unless you have written your own scripts doing communication. By default, just using the standard configuration, you shouldn't be seeing much of a difference running 2.6. If you do, let us know. Um, but now that we have basically this new infrastructure in place, I think there will be a bit of a phase where we need to collect experiences with it. I mean, what is working well in terms of also the APIs internally, the broker framework, what are the kind of abstractions that people are looking for versus what we currently have, um, also for the data store. So there are a lot, number of new angles there. And I think based on that, um, over time, we can start actually designing a, a higher level um, communication framework, higher level cluster communication framework in particular. So make, to make it easier to clusterize your scripts because that is still a pretty low level effort. In the end, often you end up sending like manually events around or you can now use the data stores, um, but even there it's, it's not quite clear yet what is the right like sweet spot for what kind of use cases um, to use them. So I think we can start thinking about abstractions just, you would just tell, okay, I, want, I have this state, I want to share it across all my worker nodes, for example, or I have something to aggregate. I want to aggregate like these pieces. Please, please uh, Zeke, do that for me. Um, and I think people have written like, like scripts, quite a few scripts which are clusterized at this point. So there are certain idioms, I think, em emerging, which we can kind of try to capture. And there will be kind of quite a bit of a discussion, and, and, and um, I'm sure we will be seeking more input on, on experiences with broker and, and, and gaps the framework currently provides there. And the, the other place that this does come up is going back to the last point with OS query. Yep. You're, you're in a, you may run a bro cluster. You're probably gonna, going to have OS query endpoints that won't be seeing network traffic. They're going to have the OS query events. But you're going to have data. So you have data on those processes. But then you're also going to have these other processes that are seeing network traffic. They're going to need to exchange data in order to like, generate a composite log. Like You can't have generate a composite log if this one knows about the endpoint stuff and this one knows about the network stuff. You end up with two separate logs. But if you want to create a composite log where you've like, put a process, um, uh, a process ID, process name, and username field into the con log, which is an example that Stefan does, uh, if you want to do that, you clearly have to bring those bits of data together. And so that's part of this, like, figuring out what sort of data flows are necessary and how do you make those scripts easy to write. 
the last point there is, is a maybe. It's, it's a bit of a technical piece, which I think would be really cool to get in, but it's, it still needs some work. So um, the one thing which, if you start writing scripts using broker, there's one thing you will probably notice pretty quickly, and that is you, a lot of the, the built-in functions that, that do that broker side communication work are operating asynchronously. So basically, you call them, and they're not immediately return because they are going out and doing communication, and there might be stuff coming back. And then um, you could be waiting a little bit for that result. So that is nothing which fits very well into rule scripting language. Right? So, so, and and, and what, what you end up doing when writing these scripts is using the when statement a lot. So you basically always end up wrapping many of these function calls into when statements, which if you've ever seen those, it's, it's a bit clunky, actually, honestly. So there's, we have a branch which introduces a new mechanism, um, um, asynchronous functions with a new keyword, async, um, which basically tells Bro that, okay, this function you're just calling might not immediately return, just do other stuff in the meantime and come back when the result is available, which makes this, this kind of programming of, of, of broker-style communication and also other actually asynchronous activity um, much more like natural, convenient, the challenge with that is that it changes the control flow model in Bro. So suddenly, an event handler does not necessarily proceed to completion at every time it runs. Sometimes it will just stop for a while, and, and Bro does other stuff, maybe accessing the same global status that event handler which just is, is on hold. Um, so we have this, this implemented, but we are not quite sure if this, this kind of change control flow model is, is really intuitive and might, or, or might be leading to like, like very um, hard to find um, problems and race conditions. So there's probably something we need to tweak in this model, maybe like, like define event handler dependencies, for example, to make sure that, that it's easy to understand what executes in which order, even in the, in, 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 when facing um, asynchronous functions. So that's why it's a maybe. I think we, we need to figure out this model still. Even though the main mechanism is implemented in, in a branch, it's, it's, it's ready, essentially. You go do <laughs> <laughs> so this is, this is a bit of, a bit of a catch-all with some specific um, technical pieces in there. So I mean, as we all know, Bro's code base started in 1995, so there's, there's just, it has evolved over time and in, in various ways. There's a lot of stuff that, that would be good to modernize more. And um, there are a number of pieces we would just like, like to start tackling. And, and, and one is, and that's something which actually um, uses see quite a bit today is, is the current I.O. loop, like the, the, the core of the system where all the packets are going in and then start being processed, um, has some uh, deficiency, I guess. And, and, the, and the main user visible one is actually the, the CPU load on a low volume link. So if you have ever run Bro on, a, on an interface having almost no traffic, it will still be running at, I don't know, 15, 20% CPU, which is kind of weird. So, so this, is, this is an artifact of the current implementation of, of, of this I.O. loop, and um, we would like to modernize that and, and, and basically come up with better mechanisms there and um, move this into the modern world, as, for example, in particular. Um, a number of people actually have asked me already about, is Bro ever going to change its regular expression implementation to something more standard? And the, the answer is we would like to. So, and then, and um, the problem is it's, it's actually not clear if there's an, another regular expression library out there that, that satisfies all the requirements that Zeek has. Um, there, I don't know. That's, we need to support capture groups. We need to support incremental input. We need to support parallel matching of multiple expressions. So there's a bunch of, of stuff. And I think we, um, we would like to take another look at, um, is there something out there which actually would, would make sense to swap in? And if so, um, I think everybody would be very happy to do that. And, and get to something more standard. We should, at this point, though, point out that after leaving bugs sitting in Bro for, I believe, 20 years, Vern just, just added case insensitive regular expressions to Bro 2.6. There's some number of people out here that are like, wait, what? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's always been a thing. Bro's never had case insensitivity, yeah, yeah. and it does now, but it's not like you think it is. Yeah. The other I, I forget how you do the case insensitivity, actually. <laughs> it's defined weird. Vern did it. Um, the, the, <laughs> the, the other feature people are always missing is capture groups, right? I mean, that is just being able to extract that sub-piece matching some parentheses in your regular expression. That is something not so easy to, to add to the current system. So that would be a feature we are looking for in a new library. 
Um, and, and personally, I want a small tweak on capture groups that nothing really supports anyway. So <laughs> there you I'm go. not even sure technically <laughs> how you would do that, but whatever. Um, so now, now with broker in place, it's actually uh, time to start removing the old communication framework and, and, and a, a bunch of additional, like, like very technical code inside the code base um, for serialization data values, which we don't need anymore or almost don't need anymore. I think there's still a couple places where we need to replace them. Um, this is, uh, personally, I'm very excited about this because I, I wrote this old code a long, long time ago and it's really not that great. <laughs> so it's, it's really time to get it out. Um, I think it will improve performance because some stuff we just don't need to do anymore now. Um, and it will simplify the code base quite a bit and, and, um, and, and help us going, going forward. But, but where is Christian? Is Christian in here? No, you had to leave oh, earlier. Oh, no. We're going to force him to rewrite copy because he cheated when he wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> Once we have done that, uh, if I think like gotten rid of the serialization, which is currently in place, we believe that it might actually become realistic um, to start overhauling the memory management as well. So for anybody who has ever worked on the broad code base hates the manual reference counting, right? I mean, it's just recipe for disaster in memory leaks. So um, that's a non-trivial task, but, but um, it's probably doable with a bit of care and, and attention. So, and, and then we will investigate um, switching probably just to share pointers or something for that. The problem is it really goes like, all across the code base. So, so it's, it's everywhere. It's even in plugins and stuff. It's so even in plugins. It's, it's going to yeah, be yeah. pretty it's, pervasive. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and that's another like, piece where we need to figure out a, like, a smooth strategy to, to not break existing stuff, or at least make it very clear when it breaks, so maybe you can't avoid the breaking in this part, in oh, this case. Unref and ref will just not do anything anymore. That's the right, 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 <laughs> exactly. Um, but I guess the larger, the, the last piece is, is just the more general. I, I think there are lots of opportunities in the, in the C++ code base to, to um, modernize and, and reduce complexity by doing so, by, by using more modern C++ features, um, standard algorithms, stuff like that. that is, but I mean, some of that can be actually automated, I think. So, so there's, there's uh, some, some code transformations I think we can just broadly apply and, and, and then just review if it looks right. There's some other cases where we need to look a bit more closely. That is also something, I don't know, if anybody is really um, kind of um, excited about Neo C++ features, this is, this is something anybody can just start working on. So if you see something which really should be done differently these days, I mean, pull requests are very much appreciated in this space in particular. That was it, I think. <laughs> so that's what we want to work on for the next year. What do you want to work on? <laughs> Any questions or thoughts or anything? Cool. Thank you. I think this is a break.